Transmission is go. Under base is live. everyone, and welcome back to Mikey's Comic Basement, where I lock you up, I throw away the key, and occasionally I throw down a sausage for you to eat. It's not a good sausage. It's one of those sausages. Yes, we are back again for a little bit of casual discussion about whatever random topic either myself or some guests come up with. Now, last time, I may have played up the uh, wee bit, the whole, oh god, not this topic, no, 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 that's because I was planning this. Um, so apologies to Chris, because I made him dance to my tune as the piper did the rats. Um, so yes, today we are talking about the current state of gender and sexuality in Transformers, specifically Transformers comics, but we'll probably branch out into some wider aspects of it. I thought it would be an interesting little chat, and I decided to get some people together to have a little convo with me, have a bit of a chinwag. Biggest group I've had for a comic basement, so this should be very interesting. So... On the order of my Skype window, I've got Optimus Prime, the elf incarnation of the person in question, who just looks like I want to smack them, like the real person, and a robot samurai, hippie, spiritualist guy who is also Wolverine, according to Empire of Stone. So we're going to start with Optimus. Introduce yourself. <laughs> I, I, first of all, I, I'm a girl, um, but I pretend to be a boy robot, so that confuses people, but it's fun. Um, I'm Haki Prime. My real name's Heather, and I'm a person, and I like comics. I read them. Can you prove any of these things? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over the internet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Next up, we have Slappy Face. Thanks, Mikey. Love you. Hey, I'm Ezra, uh, Evil Clever Dog on Twitter and Tumblr, and the elf in question would be one of my many inquisitors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. She's beautiful, Mikey. I sh- I- that doesn't mean I don't want to... You're beautiful. I want to slap you. <laughs> Are you really the person to be doing this discussion on gender, given that you've kidnapped us, thrown us in a basement, are going to throw us a sausage, and want to slap women? No, no, you. <laughs> uh, uh, do not put words in my mouth. You. <laughs> How many times have you finished that game now? Uh, three. <laughs> <laughs> do you miss the giant yellow orb in the sky? I just... I love me some fantasy games that are essentially a glorified dating sim, basically. <laughs> basic. yeah, it is kind of basically just sort of persona <laughs> with more sex. <laughs> mm. So finally, we have hippie spiritless samurai robot. Don't you talk dirty for drift. <laughs> Wolverine, as he has literally become now. He has literally... Be- the, the prophecy has come to pass, and he was fastball specialed. And no one says anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm planning nefarious things. Uh, ah, good job. To do to this thrift. She's busy establishing the matriarchy. We need to cut her some slack. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so Sprite is the mistress of flame. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> this is going to be fun. Uh Yes. Well, since I will have slightly less to talk about, because my opinions on this are relatively simple compared to a lot of people's, I think it's great. Women are fine. They get on my nerves. Everyone gets on my nerves. I don't have quite as much to add in this. I'm more of of a a ref than anything else. So my big contribution will be what you hear now, which is my giving a lovely overview of the history of female Transformers. I apologize for that. I especially apologize for the two minutes spent on Thunderblast. Because oh, God dear. bless Thunderblast. <laughs> God bless her and the people who were clearly very lonely. <laughs> so, female Transformers, they have become a bit more of um, a focal point in the fandom recently. Uh, we've had our first female writer for the comics. Um, we've had our first female creator team with uh, Boat... Sarah and Margaret, uh, working on the one book. We've had an influx of female characters with Nautica, a new version of Chromia, Windblade. Nickel. Nickel. 
Pharaoh's nickel. nickel, who was like the most fucked up person who's ever lived. I'm saying it now. <laughs> we've, we've had Strongarm, who is being hailed as a very good step forward in that she is a main character who is not conforming to the usual female body type. And, uh, just a few weeks back, we had an announcement of Victorion, the best of Woo! the bad bunch. Woohoo! I always picture her as some sort of weird giant sized Victoria's Secret model, and I need to get that out of my head, but there's something about the name Victorion that just I picture oh, her in a bra. So many tweets about that show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to enjoy when this comes out. I kind of go steampunk <laughs> because I'm normal. <laughs> so. What was the location that was picked? Was it Sea of Rust? Sea of Victoria's Secret Models from the Sea of Rust, who is yeah. rebellious. Oh, sweet zombie Jesus. So we are in kind of a, I won't say a heyday, because I did the maths on this, as Isa uh, can attest to. Some very impressive maths, I, was, I have to say. I would not have had the patience for that. I was supremely bored, um, <laughs> which I will get to uh, later on. But since I'm not as informed about this as everyone else, because I am kind of a spectator in anything involving anything, really, I've decided to get ye in to have a bit of a chat. So, Iza, female Transformers. Huh. Up until, say, three years ago, your view on the state of things. I would say that for a long time, maybe when I was younger and was sort of like just getting into Transformers, I didn't necessarily think about it as much. And that was because obviously the franchise didn't want me to think about it very much because there weren't a lot of female characters around. And when they were, they were often on their own. And so that kind of encouraged you to be really hyperly critical of them because they were a smurfette. I think we've sort of. I'm hesitant to say we've been blessed because it's not like we've actually got like 50-50 equal representation, but I do think that this recent kind of interest in it has been really, really positive and obviously is only going to add even more stuff into the mix later on. Like I knew from the second that Windblade and Chromia and Nautica were introduced that that meant this is just the beginning. These aren't the only characters we're going to get. We're going to get more characters out of this at some point. And obviously that's what started to happen now. We've got a whole combiner team on the way and the female Decepticon in the comics and in the show. There was that new female Decepticon filch was introduced recently, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just feel like stuff is improving and creators and fandom alike are obviously starting to become more open-minded, which can only be a good thing. <laughs> but yeah, I would say it was pretty dire for a long time. <laughs> uh, there's Sprite. Yeah, well, I, I mostly grew up reading the comics, which... The, the Transformers US comics, which pretty much had no female Transformers whatsoever. Oh yeah, and oh god, I just so, remembered how they introduced Arcee. We were yeah, just that, talking about this means for like an hour. Trip. Oh my god. <laughs> no, but I did not have access to Transformers UK at the time, so that went by me until I was well in my 20s. So it was just a complete sausage fest for me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, pretty much until Beast Wars came around mm. with uh, Black Arachnia, whom I did not take to at first because of obvious reasons, but I recently rewatched the whole series, and I dare say that personality-wise and character developed, she might actually be uh, possibly the best best female character ever mm. uh, that we've had so far. Well, we, I, was, um, I was actually going to get into that at a point, sort of like top fives and stuff. So that that, yeah. that was unexpected. We'll come back to that one so that everything's organized. But I'll hmm, that, hmm, hmm. continue. Sorry, interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reading the, the Dreamwave comics at the time, too, and that got cut off just before we were going to have a group of female order votes. I, I think so. I think it was RC and 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 yeah. what's from the uh, uh, the original cartoon episode. Yeah, yeah, it was going to be because they were being introduced as like a third or fourth group. I I lost track by then. Mm-hmm. Mm. That was a shame that that never happened. Mm. Got announced and then, poof, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> then we got IDW, which had a very good non-transformer female character in, in Verity, who's one of my all-time favorite character from Transformers. Mm. Well, we, we had RC, mm. but... Uh... We'll get to RC. Oh, yes. <laughs> we will get to RC. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But, yeah, pretty much uh, rather a big, big wasteland. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Hi? Um, I'm, I'm the weirdo, and, like, I actually am 
a little bit selfish in coming on this podcast because I'm using you guys to be my rungs to help me work through some crap because I'm realizing, okay, I pretend to be a dude. And I've been pretending to be a dude for my entire life. I grew up in a family full of girls, and all of my favorite characters have always been guys. Because I have this weird association of, quote, girly things with being weaker and pinker and sillier than boy things. And so I was always like, a, you know, like a militant tomboy and all this stuff. And so, like, I didn't care that there were not very many female Transformers. I've always really liked Alita One because she, and it, it is a lot down to her voice actress being able to project kind of an old Hollywood strengths. I liked that she was, she, she acts like she's 40. She doesn't act like she's 15. But, um, in general, I, I don't really need female characters. When Spotlight RC came out, I didn't hate it because I was kind of in the Simon Furman camp of why do we technically need girls? And I didn't want them to be introduced just to kind of please anyone, even though theoretically I would be in the group of people who might be pleased by that. But um watching and listening to people over the past, over the, you know, we're saying, you were saying about the last three years, Watching things kind of unfold over the last few years has made me really kind of pay more attention to why I have biases and really be interested in how these characters are developed, introduced, and and received by the fans. And and it's been interesting when when Windblade first uh, was announced, I flipped a massive table because I'm like, of course she's a girl seeker with a sword. She's everybody's little 12 year old OC. <laughs> and like, I, I was not very mature about it, but the way Margaret wrote her, she was a person and she was allowed to be, have strengths and weaknesses and, and be interesting and not just one dimensional. And she's, she's a girl, but, that's not all she is. She's not like R.C. the secretary. <laughs> mm. That that, that um, I love yeah. R.C. the secretary because it's hilarious. <laughs> I watch Headmasters and I laugh because no one matters in that show from from anything before Headmasters. And R- but R.C. has to stay because they had no female Headmaster toys. And who would Chrome Dome love? They need a love interest. You need a love. I say. If there's one thing Michael Bay has taught us, that you cannot have a woman in a in a movie. And have her not be a piece of ass. I mean, it's interesting what you're talking about, Heather, because I feel like when I was a lot younger, and this is talking like generally as well as talking about like Transformers, I think I was kind of in your camp for a while. And I'm talking about when I, when I was like a kid and preteen. Yeah. I was very much a tomboy. I hung out mostly with boys. I basically wanted to be a boy. And it was only later that I realized that the reason I associated myself mostly with like things that people would consider to be for boys as in like the toys or cartoons or whatever that I liked was because it felt it was because there's a wasteland when it comes to interesting characters and stories for women. So a lot of girls who, a lot of girls when they're quite young will recognize that, but obviously because you're very young, you don't realize the reason why it is. And so you kind of get this idea of this internalized misogyny of, everything feminine is bad because it's always portrayed poorly and there's no sort of there's not as much opportunity for diversity there you know you'll get a team where there's four guys and one girl and the girl wears pink and the girl is weak and she has to be saved and all the guys get to be a group of diverse characters with different body types and personalities and skills so it kind of paints this picture of women being defined by their gender and men being diverse and it does kind of when you're very young I I do feel it has that negative impact on girls of making them feel as though they either have to be feminine or they have to reject it entirely and you only have those two choices which is why obviously it's better when a series like Transformers can introduce multiple female characters giving different body types and personalities and so on and so forth because it creates the opportunity for girls to be able to see themselves in that and not feel like they have to conform or reject to any one thing. That was a bit of a tangent, but... <laughs> no, no, that was, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. 
I, I, do, I do think I do think it's an important uh, well a, a important angle to this because I, it's it's a very common story. Like, well, both of you and and I myself have have the same experience to the point where, as a teenager, I I had cut my hair short and I was basically running around dressed like a boy, acting like a boy, uh, wanting a boy. I, I, I wanted to be a boy, so I I always refer to that as my life as a boy <laughs> for <Yeah. laughs> for these reasons. Because I did not relate to, and I was very focused on uh, on fiction, on cartoons especially, and yeah. not relating very well to to other children. So that was my my frame of reference. I did catch on as well that the women portrayed in this fiction in cartoons were less important; they were secondary, and they were very very bland. And I did not relate to them at all. I always related to male characters. They so that's yeah. written. <laughs> yes, and, and and I think this is an important point in this discussion because this illustrates why representation matters, why yeah, it matters to have female characters, a variety of female characters, and an equal representation. Mm. Girls who have more to do than just stand around and be pink. <laughs> yeah, and and have personality and have quirks yeah. and yeah. be interesting. Yeah. And and this is actually it's actually a documented fact that the way fiction, specifically fiction for children on on TV and, and other media, has a, a beneficial effect on the self-esteem of boys, particularly white boys, and it has a negative effect on the self-esteem of of girls and uh, children of color. This this has been researched. This is a thing. It's important to to have equal representation, which which we don't have now because the TV programs for children are mostly the male centric. Uh, the majority of the characters are male, white men and boys. Uh, the majority of TV series are for boys. And even if you have uh, a so-called gender neutral series, usually it has a majority male cast. Yeah, with... that's the other thing of male being considered neutral rather than male, which yes. brings us back to Transformers very heavily, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> It's this whole idea of girls can like things that are for boys because they're gender neutral, but boys can't like things that are for girls. So yeah. you can't have girl characters on their clothes or their merchandise. This this idea that boys can't relate to female characters, which, yeah, which, which is just nonsense. It's true. true. Yeah, it's not true at all. I mean, I asked my yeah, nephew. It's like girls crazy. relate to male characters because they have no choice. So uh-huh. it should be the case that boys can relate to female characters, and they completely can. Yes, um, I think it, it, it it's also might be good for them to to be taught from an early age to relate to female characters more. Oh yeah, completely. Because, I mean, how how often do you hear men say like, "I don't understand women at all"? Yeah, exactly. I, I say that every but, day. Yeah, <laughs> well, the media does portray this image of women being women, firstly being rare, and secondly being nonsensical or difficult for men to understand. And so yeah. it's a wonder that you hear real men and real boys saying, "Oh, I don't understand girls; they don't make any sense." Because yeah, and that's it's... what they're being taught to think from such a young age. Most of the title characters, yeah. the characters who you see inside their head and you see their way of thinking, most of them are men as well. The majority of stories, the majority of perspective that we get is yeah. is male and and usually and white, white male. And well. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's no wonder if if you get that that feast of of characters, basically, you don't need to relate to anything else. Basically, you've got plenty of characters who are like you that you can relate to. Whereas with with women and minorities who, who don't get that, who get less characters for them, if they want to consume fiction, they're more asked to relate to, to characters who are not like them. Because those are usually the main characters, the the white male. Yeah, exactly. Well that's a pretty good intro, I think. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so bringing this back to Transformers a little uh, on the top, you, you know, um, female representation and how it is very biased in cartoons. I don't think anyone's ever going to make an argument against that. One of my favorite cartoons at the moment, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Hero. I love Wasp. I love Ms. Marvel. They're barely in the show. God bless them. They're barely in the show. Is that show. going on? Uh, no, no, because Jeff Loeb hates me. <laughs> Jeff Loeb hates me. I said that we come back to, like, favorite characters and whatnot, but I want to ask, not your favorite character, who you think is the best represented character, the best portrayal the the female character in Transformers that stands out as someone who who's not defined as much by their gender as by who they are, their actions, or whatever, and it can't be something from IDW. 
Like, <laughs> you can't be like R.I.D.R.C. or Windblade or Nautic or Chromia or Nickel or whatever. It has to be someone from one of the previous versions. And I'm at, this is very interesting because, as I mentioned in the intro that none of you heard yet, uh, Black Arachnia has a rather interesting origin in terms of her design. Oh, God, yes. yes. And as Sprite said... <laughs> I, I don't know this. What is it? You know how Black Arachnia has what would be called a traditionally very sexy design? Yes. <laughs> um, and she's just a retool of um, Tarantula. She's, I've actually, you know, she's a straight repaint. The story goes that the reason she's designed the way she was is that the the guys doing at Mainframe got really bored one day trying to design these characters and went to a strip club, and she is based after a very... Buxom? Buxom, that's the word. Very buxom Asian <laughs> stripper. We do not know her oh, name. Oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> Let's put that in our children's cartoon. Yes, See? yes. <laughs> and then they put nipples on the toy. <laughs> Yeah. There, there is so much wrong with Beast Wars in that regard. Was there a Razor intended to be a girl, or was she made a girl retroactively? I can never decide. I think she was intended mm. to be a girl, but, but she was she was male in the Japanese version, which got very interesting. She, but she also gender swapped like twice, so it was very confusing. Sprite, I'm assuming. I mean, you said Black Arachne might be the best female character in your mind. So, what is it that makes her that way? What is it that makes her possibly not the best one to start off with in many ways? <laughs> well, I, I I gotta put in a disclaimer here. She's not my favorite character, mm. and 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 there, there's a lot of things that are highly problematic about her in in terms of the frame in which she's portrayed, like how the other characters react around her, and uh, this whole unfortunate background design thing. But she's very complex. She's very strong-willed. She has a very intricate uh, storyline, a lot of internal conflict with, with the characters, and uh, basically a lot of plot lines revolving around her. Mm. So she's basically a very complex, a very developed character. Mm. There's there's a lot going on with her in, internally, and and that's I, I always say that she's she's this 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 stereotypical. Femme Fatal character, but she rises above it because of the complexity of her character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hahi? I would say I, I really enjoyed actually the way that RC in Transformers Prime was portrayed. Mm. I mean, that, that show didn't always have great depth of character, but I really appreciated that RC was very feminine, but she was very much herself. She was allowed to be both strong and weak and to have deep feelings for people without it being, this is my current man crush, or anything like that. So I like that. But um, about just quickly what, what Sprite was saying about Black Arachnia, the thing that I liked about her was that she took a type that I've always sort of inherently disliked of the very sexy woman and made me like her. You know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a sexy woman. <laughs> I think it's and so I always like was slightly jealous and put off and intimidated by people who have that sort of demeanor, and so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm I'm horrible in my brain. Like, You're such a slut, whatever. But Black Arachnia was was very much who she was, but she was more than just her jugs in the front. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there, there was more to her. I than may that. use that one and, in the future. <laughs> So, so I guess, so any, any female character in anything that sort of transcends what they look like mm. is awesome. Cause we, we get this deal of if you are a woman, what matters most is what you look like. And so I always appreciate it when a character is themselves and what they look like is secondary. Mm. Mm. Uh, is it? Well, I was robbed of my true answer in my heart, which was Nautica. Yes, yes, but that's because you just have a thing for wrenches. My <laughs> robot girl crush. Um, <laughs> I'm probably going to have to say Prime RC as well, mm. but the reason I brought up Nautica is because the reason for me choosing her is pretty similar to the reason I would have chosen Nautica, which is that in Transformers, when you do get female characters, often they're very isolated. You know, RC is the only female Autobot on the team, and Nautica is the only female uh, character on the Lost Light not counting characters, holoforms, and so on. Yet, I often felt like, for the most part, those characters are well-written enough to not feel like have they have the burden placed upon them of being the girl. Mm. Um, and perhaps it, perhaps part of that could be 
because in Prime there are two female humans who hang out with the Autobots a lot. But yeah, like uh, he said, RC is allowed to be both strong and weak. She has character development. She has relationships with people that aren't just love interest type relationships. She's pretty multifaceted. Um, she also has a great voice actress, which always helps. So yeah, I think I'd have to say Prime RC. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also really like Alita 1. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. obviously the G1 episode involving her is not the best. Oh no, it's hilarious. It's amazing. As all G1 is. But uh, Alita 1 is a character I would really like to see given the chance to be in the spotlight again. Like if we were to get more female characters in IDW or in RID mm. or anywhere else in the future, I think I feel like I would really like a buff military commander Alita One who can bench press Ultra Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm desperately hoping that she's a leader of one of the planets. <laughs> yeah, it would be really cool. And I'd want her to still be pink, so she's pink and like buff as fuck and can rip your fucking spark out. <laughs> see, uh, see, I just want them to do an audio version now and she just has the daintiest little voice. <laughs> I did that and she's like normal size and then she opened and she's like um, that one from Venture Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want the contrast, damn it. Well, from my sort of input in this, interesting, I've got two. Um, RC is, from Prime, is my main one because I think RC is interesting because at no point do I ever feel that it matters that she's a girl. It, you know, you, you talked about isolation there. She's not isolated from the group by someone turning around and making a girl related joke. Yeah. I mean, the, the, wor- which is often what happens. Yeah. The worst we kind of get there is that, am I acting like his mother? And that's kind of like, you got, Bulkhead does the same to Miko. Miko. It's been so long since I've seen it. Bulkhead does the same to Miko, what she does to Jack. So it, it's not like she's alone in that. So mm-hmm. I thought that was a good, I, I really enjoyed yeah. And I also, actually, sorry to interrupt mm-hmm. you, but I really liked how they, they paired her with the main yeah, boy. Yeah, well, she was the main Autobot. Normally that she would be paired off with the girl, so I mm-hmm. felt like that was quite an interesting mm-hmm. uh, decision. I, I would say that RC is the main character in that show. I would absolutely say it's her show. Like She was the one I was rooting for from the beginning, to be honest. I was like, all these Autobots are boring apart from Ratchet. Oh, Ratchet's but amazing. I just, I just want more <laughs> RC. Oh, man, if Ratchet doesn't show up in R.I.D., there is no God. <laughs> but uh, R.C. was interesting to me because she, re- I always felt it was her story. Like, uh, the, openings, the opening five-parter, she is the main character by far. Optimus does the fighting. She is the character. Yeah, that's correct. Optimus yeah. isn't a character in that show. God love him. I love Prime to death as a show. I absolutely adore it, but I think that Prime is so so flawed in that in that portrayal. But my other main one is Stryker. Oh, yeah. Ooh, she's awesome. Because I can't yeah. think of a thing. I mean, in terms of like representation, I wouldn't say she's my favorite female character by any stretch. Um, but it, if we're talking she's about she's important, I think. Well, the, the important thing yeah, about Stryker yeah. is that I can't think of a single time anyone ever even acknowledged the fact she was a girl. She was this big, hulking monster, this general who has no loyalty to either cause and is loyal to the planet. She has a consort, but that is a bio line. And her entire world is this hard-ass military general. And at no point does any... You know, Black Arachnia in that show is murdered as a character. I mean, I think Beast Machines... Mm. It's not my favorite show by, uh, at all, but it's a very, very well-written, mature show. But Black Arachnia and Silverboat get screwed horribly yeah. in every single way. The only thing about Striker that anyone cares about is that she is going to rip your feckin' head off. Yeah, so you mean she she gets to be a character by her own terms and not just this one it's, is a girl? It's not just that she gets to be a character by her, her own terms. She gets to be a character like that. Yeah, R- which R-C is very, get, very rare. Yeah, yeah, R.C. in Prime gets to be a character, but she does fall within a certain archetype. She is yeah. the big sister. Mm. Strike is... And she has, you know, a certain body type. Yeah. Um, she's the sweetest one of the group, but that does not hold her back. Yeah. But Striker is mo- big and hulking, and generally you would look at a character and like has that. has no mouth. No name and no pronouns, and you would say that's a dude, because that's yeah, what we're taught to but do. But. I, I think it was, when she showed up again in Animated, I have to admit, like, the fact we did not get toys in those 5 is the single greatest crime. Mm-hmm. Blackout excluded. I know it was like, I suppose, but... Um, but when she showed up in Animated, again, same kind of role. She's just in charge. Like, the biggest guy in the team bows down to her. And yeah. again, no, no issues. There's an extra thing in the bio that she's Lugnaut's consort, but that's a reference to Beast Machines, and the fact that Lugnaut's amazing. 
it was just a nice I, I really like Stryker's portrayal it from the point of view of making her a character first. Yeah. Mm. And and Yeah. So we sort of covered um some of the positives. Stryker, Black Arachnia, RC. I think there's a few weaker ones. Sort of that might be used to highlight the issues. Um I think I may have mentioned their queen earlier on. So would anyone like to start mentioning people who they think are exactly what's wrong with the franchise in terms of female characters? Again, before IDW. Mm, well. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to mention RC first? No, no. I, I think whoever's going for RC has to go last, because that will go on. <laughs> I mean, well, we could talk about we could talk about the uh, Elisa One female Autobots episode, which you know you could argue either way for it. I guess there are positives and there are negatives. Uh, nothing is ever just you know one dimensional. It's this thing of the female characters are in that episode they are like a one off special. They don't really appear again, and the guys are the main characters and they're in every single episode and you have one female human who occasionally hangs out with them and then you get these pretty cool female characters who could have been developed further but then they're pretty much all paired off with their one Autobot boyfriend and then you never really see them again. I um, hated that. Because mm, I, re- yeah. I really like this character and like I want to see more of them and never seen again. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I judge the interesting of a character by whether or not I want to write them. <laughs> and so that group of, of the little female Autobots group, I, I find them interesting enough to want to write about Alita as, you know, someone who can hold her own in a siege on a planet for an umpty gajillion years with her little group. I think that's cool. And, and even just the fact that she is paired up with Prime I think is awesome because it shows that she is his equal and we're, we're you know set yeah. up to be Prime is the uber awesome and she in general in my perception as someone who's watched that show that particular episode more often than I've watched most other episodes of G1 because I like it but I really liked her the other girls I really liked until a specifically Moonracer and Firestar got paired off Chromia and Ironhide just works for me. I'm like, you know what? You two can be like whatever definition of robot pals you are. But the fact that all of them instantly got paired off, I'm like, what are the odds that the one, the dudes that came over just happened to all be your boyfriends? Yeah. And, and it really, it lessened them. Yeah, well, they weren't they, they weren't allowed to be I just like, themselves. To your place, remember that these female characters aren't valid without a male character there to. Yeah, remark. and they were so cool. I mean, they they they'd hung on through something a really difficult situation if you you know really look at it, and yet you know <laughs> they just happen to have to have guys at their side. Yeah, yeah I mean, I probably would have. I, I, I completely see what you're saying actually about Alita and Optimus kind of being like the equivalent of each other, like equals. And I feel like I would have found it a lot more interesting if, if it were like that, if Alita was sort of, you know, they weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. They were sort of military equals or yeah. skills wise, they were equals and they recognized that mutually. But obviously it was the eighties and. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying? We still have that now, but like, you know what I mean? Um, you know, it is, I, I feel like all of those characters deserve more and I'm really happy that Chromia is in the comics now and I really hope we see the other ladies again soon as well. Yeah. I will say one thing that takes me off the most in that entire episode is how when Prime leaves, he's like, I gotta go. And then he like, hold her hand for literally one frame and then he walks off like nothing. And I'm like, she deserved <laughs> way more respect from you and you of all dudes should have given her that. Because, you know, that's who Prime is supposed to be. He's supposed to be the guy who values people and he doesn't yeah. properly value her after all the stuff that they go through. I'm like, gosh dang it, who part of this episode? <laughs> <laughs> Men in the 80s. <laughs> Men in the 80s. They, like, their run cycles were repeated over and over and over. 
<laughs> like we put in one frame, that'll do, right? Okay. <laughs> oh dear. Um. Yeah. Um. Any other examples you'd like to bring up? I, 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 again, we're gonna do, we're gonna try and limit this because we do have to like sleep and eat at some point in the next. <laughs> um. So, uh, is it brought up one sprite? Can we talk about our shoe yet? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm saving yeah. that. IDW very important coming end. Well, it's, it's 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 a bit problematic that there's so few female characters that when there are any, they're usually the main characters who are usually better developed than those female characters that don't exist. Uh, <laughs> 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 so there's not, there's not a lot of choices here for more developed than the ones that don't exist. Good job. Well done. <laughs> no, that's, that's kind of true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I'll be honest, I think most characters are better developed than the ones that don't exist. Unless they're an arrow. <laughs> yes, yeah. but, but it, it is the point. Like, when you have female characters, they're usually that, that one token female on the cast, and yeah. there... you don't get a lot of background female characters and no. female characters and stuff like that. I read something really interesting recently about that actually, where they were kind of it was I think it was mostly to do with like Hollywood movies, but they were basically measuring, counting how many women appeared in films and people of color as well, and they were doing it by how many like main female roles there were, how many secondary, and then how many sort of extras or one off line characters and they found that generally there would be like one maybe two female characters in the main or secondary cast and then most of the sort of characters like cab drivers or the, they go to the doctor the doctor is male and the people in the patient room are male and stuff like that and it was you know overwhelmingly white and male basically uh, which kind of gives this impression of the world being mostly white and mostly male which would be problematic because that's not the way the world is. And in Transformers, that's even more amplified because there's this idea that, that the idea that male is neutral is amplified ten times fold in Transformers because there's always these excuses for women not being there, uh, which are completely arbitrary because Transformers have always had gender from the moment Optimus Prime was called he. That's always something I'm tripping over in the IDW comics, like when you have this crowd scenes of aliens, and you've got uh, aliens that look kind of humanoid, and you've got aliens that look kind of undefinable, and... When you got the humanoid uh, aliens, they're all male, and there's this one token yeah. female, and basically I play a game with that uh, called Where's Walda. It's like, find the female <laughs> alien! <laughs> I'm not gonna start this out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of depressing, really. It just... It's really but... interesting when you can play that, and you find the results more interesting. Like, I was reading an issue of Ms. Marvel recently, where I specifically chose to focus on a lot of the background characters and found that they were They're really, really diverse, diverse. They? so diverse and so interesting and like there's obviously quite a lot of thought put into them like there's people with very different body shapes people with wearing like t-shirts with references to superheroes on them people with like really interesting hairstyles as well as like people of different races and genders and stuff like that there's so much creativity waiting to be tapped in those kind of things like you know, your readers can flip through the pages and be like, oh, cool, that character in the crowd, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like a little extra thing that sometimes maybe I wish creators did more often. Like, think about well, that instead of just mm-hmm. referring back to what they would assume normally to be the norm instead of thinking about how they can make it a bit more interesting. Did uh, you notice, though, the free comic book day Robots in Disguise book that Prips did has, has really, a lot of women in the yeah, back, right? <laughs> it has... It has lots of um, various skin tones in it, not just white. Yeah, yeah. And a lot, just a lot of different types in it. And, and I noticed that. And I'm not the greatest at noticing that sort of thing. But I noticed oh, that. Cool. I actually missed Free Comic Book Day. It, oh, it, but that's really it cool. Made, mm-hmm. It made the fact that the actual cartoon itself is focused on white characters really stand out. Because once you got yeah. to those characters, I was like, wow, they are white, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. I, I think and that's it, it. Yeah. It made me notice kind of the the way we default to white dudes. That was yeah. kind of the first time I was like, oh, yeah. I can't stop noticing it. It's like yeah. single. Can't stop. <laughs> like, at first, it's like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. And the more it happens, the more you're like, come on now, really? <laughs> it's <done for> me. <laughs> I think in, in this this, uh, uh, this way, our ideas actually feels like a step back to me, because it's mm. it's like 
because you've got Strongarm, who is who is really cool in in terms of design and personality, and and definitely a step forward uh, in terms that she's not not very uh, her design isn't that feminine yeah, that feminine. you usually get, and uh, her her personality is neither. Uh, but in in terms of what goes on around her, like I'm not sure if 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 it has passed the Bechdel test yet. Uh, for one thing, and and that's because. Uh, well, when, 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 when you have the previous cartoon, like, uh, um, Prime, you've got RC and you've got Miko straight back. That's two female characters who can play off each other, and later on you get June Darby. June, yeah. In our idea, the main cast is, is all these dudes and, and her. And you've got Filch at some point, who is, uh, Decepticon. So I've not got around watching Red yet, but are there no female humans in Red? There's Hank. Yeah, the, 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 the front of, um, Hank. Hank. She doesn't like Hank. being called Henrietta. <laughs> oh, right. Um, yeah, but, but she's like in one right. episode. She's in one episode, and I don't know if they're ever planning to bring her back. Um, Windblade's coming, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm. It's really cool. And she's also got an Asian voice actress. Yes, yes, she does. That ties into what I was going to add to Sprite's point, which is that what's really interesting is that when when you say that you feel like Rid is a step back, I realized quite recently, because I rewatched a couple episodes of Animated, that both Prime and Animated had woman or a girl of colour as one of the main characters. Yeah. Yeah. And Prime also has a lot of uh, POC voice actors voicing a lot of the robots, like RC, uh, I think Bulkhead, Black Arachnia, or Arachnia, what she's called in that one, and quite a few others, I think, as well. Sari and her father are both people of colour in Animated, and you've got Miko in Prime. I don't know why, but I just hadn't clocked that the first time I watched Animated. It just kind of didn't really sink in. But when I rewatched it, I was like, holy shit, they're Indians! Oh my god! <laughs> I wanted to be in the room for that. <laughs> holy shit, they're Indians! Well, that <laughs> seems a bit rude. <laughs> oh god. Um, Hahi, do you have uh, one you'd like to throw into the pot? Oh, as a bad example of a female character? Yes, because and you can't use aside, mine. You can't use mine. Aside from Thunderblast? Oh, you can't use mine! <laughs> <laughs> I'm saving mine because I love mine dearly. She is close to my heart. And it has to, it can't be a human character. It can be anything in the show. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm going to call out Alexis then from Armada. Oh. Because she was so, the girl! And look, yeah. I'm so much better than you boys! And Starscream loves me the best! <laughs> and, yeah, and, Armada was the show I watched when I was like 11. <laughs> and I well, was so like, bitch, she's mine! <laughs> I, I have a weird relationship with Armada because, okay, so I I am like the most newbie of fans here in that I missed Transformers the first time. I, I mean, I was around, but we didn't have a TV, and we watched Mask instead at my friend Justin's house. And so when, don't hit me, when the true 2007 movie came out, the, the scene where everybody drives up and transforms, I was like, oh, shit, this is awesome! And... I went back and watched, like, all of G1 on YouTube and decided I wanted to be Optimus Prime. And then I got to the end of G1, and I was like, gosh dang it, I'm going to die, and there's going to be nobody for me to pretend to be. And I wrote this, like, big melodramatic email to my family. I'm like, you guys, on Thursday, June 12th, whatever year it was, I will die. <laughs> right. And so then I, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, there's no trans. What else is there? And then I found Armada, and I was like, okay, okay, more Transformers show to watch. And so I like watched all of it, and it was pretty crap, <laughs> but it was the one thing that was there. And so I kind of glommed onto it in a weird way. And you know, then I went and found Beast Wars, and went, oh, there are good shows. And you know, have been like diving into comic books the entire time. And comic books are the truth and the way. But um, so. Well, yeah, my point. I didn't have one. Anyway, <laughs> so, but yeah, Alexis, so, like, I have this weird uh connection with her in that by the time that series was done, I had kind of joined the Starscream fangirl club, and at some point, we need to talk about my shame in that. <laughs> to be fair, everyone on the planet is in that club, regardless of gender. No one wants to admit it. But it's happened to the best of us. Everyone. Well, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but everyone, man, woman, dog, 
<laughs> they have a star scream that seeps into their soul, and they're just like, yeah. "Mine is not actually a star scream character." This is something I realized when I watched the Green Lantern animated series. Such a good show. <laughs> Such a good show. But who was oh, who was the the evil guy who turned good? Razor. Was it Razor, Razor or something? Razor Mayday. So, I, I realized when I was watching it, I was like, "Fuck, he's my favorite character, and he's <laughs> the star scream." Yep. Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck you, Cartoon Network. <laughs> But yeah, so like I was like slightly jealous of her, but at the same time I was like, yeah, you know what? You do not have to be like I'm the smart one all the time. So anyway, there we go, Alexis. The end. Next thing. <laughs> Since I held on to it, Thunderblast would be my example. Uh, for the same reason, I adore Flame War because it's hilariously stupid. What happened to Flame War with the Bakkon comic? Uh, his reasoning um, was, well, it's a ridiculous idea. I thought I'd take it to the nth level, and I laughed so hard because it's everything wrong with Japanese media, and yet everything <laughs> hilariously right. Because I can just look at it and say, this is so bloody stupid. And Thunderblast is kind of the same thing because her entire <laughs> meaning of existence is to try and bed Megatron, <laughs> and she has nothing else going on in her life, nothing. <laughs> And she has nipples. <laughs> and she has breasts the size of cantaloupes. So it's shockwave. And someone sculpted nipples. And it's hilarious. And I love it. I love it in a terrible way. Because it's everything wrong with that kind of stuff. It's everything wrong with how how the Japanese portray women in terms of equality and everything else. And I'm laughing my head off. And I'm just like, oh my god, this is so dumb. So, and that's all I've got in Thunder Blast. It's just like, God love her and Jesus Christ who made her because you, you sir, need counseling. <laughs> because I know it's a sir. We all know it's a sir. And oh yeah. <laughs> um, did anyone else have any opinions on Thunderbolt? Well, we could, t- we could talk about Flame War as well. <laughs> oh, I need to get the toy. Do not want that toy. That is- I mean, yeah, that Botcon comic is just. <laughs> 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 where, do we, where do I even begin? <laughs> oh, where do you end is the question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's probably not even worth going into because it would take so long to pick apart everything that was, because it's everything. Like, just <laughs> complete objectification. Like, okay, let's move on. Uh, I'll just I, ask I, about this my <laughs> holy grail is that Bakkon toy. I, I got my Grimlocks. My next holy grail is Flame War Bakkon. Because that toy has a special place in my heart now. <laughs> because it's so bloody stupid. Oh, uh, dear. So, um, I've laughed at the idea of robot nipples. We've talked about the portrayal of women as basically chasing the man. We've talked about basically how you can screw up introducing the female concept in the first place. And uh, kind of everything in between. So, we are in a bit of an interesting um, era where female voices in comic books are becoming, I won't say more prominent but they are becoming more recognized by the wider media. Mm. There are w- websites like Women Talk About Comics and the Mary Sue and whatnot, but it, when you go to like stuff like The Outhouse or Comic Alliance, there is now a sizable number of articles based on female perspectives, uh, issue, issues women have with certain comics, um, like the Batgirl cover from a while back. You've got articles written by men praising the more positive um, portrayal of women in various comic books like Thor and Captain Marvel and Ms. Marvel and Rat Queens and whatever. And Saga. Was Sa- I don't Actually, I don't know. Is Saga, like, considered positive for females? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Saga's awesome. I, I'm like, how can it not be? <laughs> I don't know. I remember lying. Saga's one of those books where, and this counts for the, like, the non-white characters as well like there's just so oh, yeah. many of them and it, so it becomes completely normalized to have that many women and that many people of color and that many aliens <laughs> in one yeah. comic like it all just becomes completely normalized yeah. which is pretty hopeful i think yeah. all i remember about saga is that i read it for 12 issues <laughs> and lion cat's cool i like lion cat i want a lion oh, cat yeah, like this also I, I am the guy who read rack queens and kind of wish it stayed in the form it was in for volume one but uh, so, I mean, ye are far, far more informed than this and, than I am. So, what is causing the shift? Because in Transformers, in the three years since Morton Meets Iron already have been going, there has been an increase in the number of vocal female fans uh, of comics. Now, I've been going to conventions for many years, and I know there's as many women who are into Transformers as men. It just, it seems to be their voices are, again, being recognized more. 
So what is causing the shift here? And do you think this is a marketing shift or a shift that will have some permanent place? I think I think social media definitely plays a huge part in it. Uh, websites like Twitter and Tumblr um, and, you know, other sort of places online where people have these conversations and they're, they reach a wider audience than they would without those websites, without the ability to be online and for them to reach literally anyone who can happen to find it. It means that there's proof that, you know, there's a lot of female fans. There's a lot of fans in general from of all genders and all walks of life who want these changes. So it's like it's like no one can no longer say girls don't play video games or girls don't read comics because you can quite plainly see that girls not only play video games and read comics, but they want to create them as well because they have Twitter accounts and Tumblr accounts and they make fan art and they make their own comics and they make their own games. Um, so there's no longer the sort of myth of, but are there any female fans out there? Will anybody care? So that allows those different voices to be heard and it reaches the creators because they also use those websites. Mm. So they can see maybe mistakes they've made or positive things they've done and alter what they're doing accordingly. But so yeah, I think definitely the internet and, and probably the types of communities that occur on the internet has a huge thing to do with it. Mm. Like the fact that the Tumblr Transformers fandom, I know that the Tumblr UK Transformers fandom, for example, is quite tightly knit. Mm. I know pretty much Every every person who goes to auto assembly who is on Tumblr, I think I pretty much know all of them. Um, so you get these sort of tight knit communities who will talk amongst themselves, and then will, you know, when when the when the poll went up, the the fan poll for what that Windblade ended up being created from. I remember this huge, obviously this huge deal was made out of it on Tumblr. Of, oh my God, there's the option for a female character. Let's all vote female, and then we can have a female character. And then we got three out of it. So there's the uh, opportunity for actual gratification coming out of these communities where you also get to see what everyone's talking about all the time. Mm. Um, Sprite? Well, I, th- I think that's certainly true, but I think the female audience is is growing as well uh, yeah. exponentially. And, and also I think social media has a lot to do with that because girls network like crazy and, and they infect each other with with whatever they're they're passionate about. So there's a lot of people, specifically girls, who come into Transformers who weren't Transformers fans before, uh, specifically with, with Mortal Kombat CI, which which is has a very passionate female audience. So they see these uh, scenes and panels and stuff from the comics, and they don't know what it's about, but it makes them laugh or they think it's good, and they uh, they get more interested in it, and they become fans themselves. And I think that's also a pretty big factor. Yeah, the social, yeah, definitely how, just how social and how open those communities are in, in getting other people involved in them and getting new people interested in their passions. Mm. Mm. Hi. Well, I would credit polls and research, first of all, that the marketing departments figured out there were actually girls that were interested in this sort of thing and to uh, kind of disprove the assumption that these things are just for boys. I would also credit um, any little local shops that are trying to be more welcoming to women because <laughs> comic book stores can be extremely intimidating. The only reason I didn't get into comics when I was like in college, I came across some that I, I, I came across um, uh, the Max and it blew my mind. And I'm like, I need to get into this medium, but I had no idea how. And, what with the internet and, and like, you know, the whole networking between girls and, and, um, people being aware that there is a market for stories that aren't just marketed to 13 year old boys. It's all kind of come together in, into this kind of perfect storm of recognition and creating things that are for everyone, not just a certain subgenre of humans. Mm. Well, I, I think I think we should also uh, give some credit to the new digital era, which mm-hmm. expands the, the the comic markets as well and allows people who who do not have access to comic stores or, like many girls, do not like to set foot in them to to get comics through other means. You can you can now order trades from the internet. You can order comics from the internet. You can read comics digitally, and I think that's also a huge fa- factor to make comics more accessible outside that male demographic who are catered through via comic stores. 
And also, I think we need to credit the creators for being willing to change. Oh, yes. Just think about what they have done, especially in just the last, you know, stretching it clear out to maybe even five years, which is especially John Barber and James Roberts and, you know, Margaret Scott has been, she is who she is and they have welcomed her in, in a way. I mean, that this does sound like, we are the men, you may come and have, take coffee with us, madam. To be fair, she but, does but, punch sharks. But that is what the comics industry is like for a lot of women. Yes, it, it is. And, yeah. and Unless so, you Gail just, Simone. You know, people <laughs> being willing to allow it to change. Yeah, because, people wanting yeah. to change, not, you know, because they can see that that's what other people want. Like, it's a mm-hmm. selfless thing and obviously you know there is a marketing aspect like mikey mentioned earlier of you know female thor outsells male thor by like 30 25 percent or something so obviously there is there's money to be made here and primarily marvel and idw and dc and all these companies they are businesses and they need to make money they need to up their sales they need to find out what the hot new thing is that everyone wants and they've realized that yeah diversity is something that people want people love miss marvel people love female thor people love batgirl people love windblade uh, people of Saga, whatever. You were wondering whether it was something that was going to stick around or whether it was just a sort well, of... It's, it, will, I, it will stick around. An example I'd I use... Oh, yeah. An example I'd use is... Do you remember, is a, ages ago, I may have had a wee bit of fun with you about the, the Captain Marvel costume. Ages oh, yeah, we had a, a brief Twitter conversation where you said you didn't, you weren't a fan I, of the new I, one? Well, I'm not a fan of it because I'm sorry that is an evil mohawk, but I may have been having a wee bit of fun with Don't this mohawk! It, well, she looks like a super villain! When she's she wearing the mask, she, she looks like a supervillain. Awesome. I have a figure right above me right now. She looks sick. She looks she like, yeah, awesome. she looks like she's going to kill you. Yeah, because she will, because she's Captain Marvel. <laughs> you know what? I'll, for, you know, yeah, you have your murderous version. I'm going to have her without the mask where she looks like no, a fucking I mean, human being. But I think what's really interesting about Captain Marvel's new costume, and this is a complete diversion from what we're meant to be talking about, but I will defend that costume. It's really interesting to me. Because firstly, it has visual aspects that are reminiscent of her previous costume Mm. with the sash and everything like that. But it's, it's a costume that isn't about her being a woman. It's a costume that's about her skill set and it's about her as a person. She's a pilot previously to this. So she's wearing what is basically, you know, an altered version of what a pilot might wear, Mm. but it's superhero eyes. And the reason I really like the Mohawk is because too often <laughs> female characters that are usually designed by men just sort of, they just have hair. It's just long hair. <laughs> they have hair. Uh, they just they just have long hair because women have long hair, right? And I just found it really interesting that they had a female character who didn't just have long hair because that's what girls have, right? She has a, a hairstyle mm. that is unique and, you know, it makes her silhouette stand out, basically. It does. So makes them look really a bit like the evil whiplash, but it does make them stand out. <laughs> and that's my defense of Captain Marvel. Mm. <laughs> well, all, all in all, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I like her, the costume most, of, mostly. I, I'm not a huge fan of it, just because I, at least it doesn't have goggles. At least it doesn't <laughs> have the bloody goggles. So much. I hate those bloody goggles. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But, you know, would you ever think that, like, sales of Captain Marvel drop? The Captain Marvel movie comes out and it doesn't do as well as people expected. Sales drop. Would you say that uh, in order in order to kind of up the hype for a book that I despise, they took a very beloved character and made her into something she very much wasn't before? Because they, they, their answer to that was sex sells. Yeah, I mean, it just... it. This is the thing, is these characters obviously change hands a lot. Um, and including in Transformers, like this is a 30 year old franchise and Marvel and DC are even older. Uh, these characters change hands. Not every writer and not every artist is going to treat them well. They're not always going to respect female characters the way they should be respected. And they may even like just completely wreck on them or destroy them or kill them off or whatever. Especially when you go from comics to movies, they change hands into a completely different environment that is completely sexist and completely racist Hmm. and very, very difficult to kind of break into with those kind of characters. The Captain Marvel movie, my hope is that it's going to be amazing with Nicole Perlman writing it, Hmm. uh, whoever's directing it. But I I am, honestly, I have my worries mostly because it, it feels like with her and Black Panther, like these are the ones, like Black Panther is the person of color movie and Captain Marvel is the woman movie. 
And if they don't work, then we won't get them again, Mm. because that's the kind of attitude that people in Hollywood have, which is complete bullshit. Like, basically, the movie has to be good and it has to be marketed well. And and it is a known thing that movies and games with female leads often get less marketing support. And marketing is pretty much everything when it comes to movies. Like, there's a reason the Transformers movies make so much money, even though they are admittedly quite shit. (laughs) And it's because they 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 have the most money put behind them, not only for making them, but also for marketing them and getting them out there and getting people to see them. And you don't get that with movies with female leads as often. Uh, the exception maybe would be something like the Hunger Games. Mm. But, you know, you do, you you get movies about women and people of colour that kind of slip under the radar mm. um, or aren't as widely distributed in as many cinemas, which means that not as many people can even see them. Mm. So, you know, there's a game played with marketing as well that's really kind of vital to a movie's success. And I would hope that since it's a Marvel movie, that Black Panther and Captain Marvel will be treated as well as something like Guardians of the Galaxy and Avengers have been, because Marvel know how to sell a movie. Mm. They know how to produce amazing trailers and get people, get bums in seats, basically. So my hope is that as much passion goes into marketing those films, as well as making them as good as all the other ones, and that they're not kind of allowed to slip by, and then they have an excuse to not make any more films about women and people of colour. That was a complete fucking tangent. Tangents are fine. <laughs> but Sprite, you think it's... Because <laughs> everything is a says it's all bullshit. And you're wrong about the mohawk. Um, Sprite, <laughs> you think um this is here to stay, then? Yes. Oh, yeah, that was the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 just... Because you, you can't really focus on, on one title and say, well... This might do well, mm. this might not do well, because it's, it's, it's a bigger picture here. And the bigger picture is that female characters, female led titles, the female audience is, is a big thing. But the female audience is, is here. Stay here. And it will stay here. So it, it just doesn't make sense to, to not cater to them. And of course that the um, titles that are generally seen as, as the ones targeting to this audience. With, with Miss Marvel, with the female tour, but also with uh, uh, with image titles like uh, uh, Saga, uh, Red Queens. They're titles that are critically acclaimed and that, that, that are popular and get a lot of attention. And they're, and they're good stories. They're good comics. And it's basically like if, if you've had good comics, they'll sell. And of course, uh, there's a lot of women who will buy them. So that just won't go away. Mm. And it's also the, the comics industry at this moment is growing, and it's growing in part because of this female audience, and, and, and publishers aren't blind to that. Yeah, and of course also because because you are now seeing not only an influx of characters and stories with women and people of colour in them, uh, and LGBT representation as well, obviously, that also means that more artists and writers will be introduced who are part of that yes. uh, spectrum of humanity as well. And that obviously will have an effect on who in the future will make comics. And obviously, if you have more women and people of color and people from the LGBT plus community around, they're more likely to want to make their voices and their stories heard and make stories about those kind of characters. So it will no longer just be white men deciding who gets the spotlight. It will be a whole different kind of group of people as well. Mm. Um, and so, you're, you know, I think the change is here to stay because what's in a way, what's more important than characters is creators, because, you know, these are real women and real people of colour and LGBT people who are earning a living and who are bearing their soul and creating stories. Mm. And they're the people who are going to carry it on. Mm. Um, and then the next generation of people who grew up thinking, hey, there's a character who's a Pakistani female superhero. I can be a superhero too. I can draw superhero comics too, because she's like me. And they'll all grow up and become part of that industry as well so it will just keep growing i think but it's basically what's happening is 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 we're creating a new normal for comics Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the way i see it is now that i know these things exist you know i'm not going to stop liking them i'm not going to stop liking comics that speak to me so i will now for the rest of my life seek out good comics just because i know how to find them now and i know they exist and so I'm assuming that there's lots more people like me who happen to be female and who like certain types of things. And, you know, we, we've got in the door now. You can't close it. <laughs> Put a door up, uh, a door up against the door. I was going to 
That doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. God damn it. <laughs> it's okay. Right, so I think it's time to bring this um, to where I think we've always been heading with this, because we talked about Transformers, we talked a little bit about comics in general. Let's talk about the big triple-lettered uh, elephant in the room. IDW, which took on the license yay on like nine years ago now. Longest running continuous Transformer series. Um, in terms of like ongoing issues based in one country or one um, sequence, it's, uh, it has passed Mar- US Marvel. I- IDW has been uh, an up and down in terms of quality. I don't think anyone will ever argue that it was all good or all bad. Um, it is currently in this bizarre phase of, hey, good comics, get stuffed. You ain't on our league. Because, you know, Mord Meets the Eye consistently levels comics that have, are supposedly of superior creative teams. R.I.D. has touched on political matters that I don't think I've seen handled so well in years. And, of course, gender and sexuality have all come into this. In recent years, we've had our first official homosexual couple in Transformers. Homo-romantic. Homo Homo-romantic, I apologize. We have our first gay couple. There. Put it, put it back in your pants, Mikey. I, <laughs> I'm being clean this time around. She's being that. Yeah. So yeah, we have Chrome Dome Rewind, we have uh, Brainstorms, for, I suspect fairly one-sided affection for... Um, microscopes. Microscopes. microscopes in general. <laughs> I, just, I just want He's something a with a type. good zoom function. <laughs> He's got a type, come on. He has a type. Um, <laughs> and we have our first bunch of uh, officially normal female Transformers. In IDW, I say normal because uh, back in Spotlight RC, Transformer, the female concept was introduced as an anomaly based on the fact that Jaxus has too much time in hand. Awesome. I don't know what the reception of that was in general, because when I read um, Spotlight RC, I came into IDW quite late, just in time for All Hail Megatron. But, you know, my attitude towards RC at the time was that I think it's a cool sci-fi concept. I don't really see why this needs explaining, but... I, uh, I, I've developed a, a very strong awareness of people who approach Transformers as hard sci-fi versus what I consider soft sci-fi. Yeah, were any of you there at the beginning, so to speak? I mean, what was kind of the reception of the issue when it came out? To be honest, I don't think I was really reading IDW comics mm. when it came out. Sprite? So. Uh, I read it at the time, but I wasn't part of the online community yet, so... Mm. Uh, well, I, I do know it was controversial from the beginning because um, I've read, uh, I, I, I have read uh, old forum threads mm. when when the controversy got stirred up again. <laughs> but like, because I had the same question, like, what was the reception at the time? And I think it it was the same issues got raised uh, from the beginning. Yeah. Hi, you oh. you heard anything? Yeah, I I was I I read it at the beginning, but I was just in like a little very close knit forum, and we didn't delve too deeply into comics at the time, and so I just read it and went, huh, that was interesting. Moving on. Yeah. So, what was your reactions to RC, the transgender angry lady? I would not call her transgender. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's problematic on lots of different mm. layers, and I think there are lots of different ways people could interpret it. Um, but, I mean, ultimately, it does, it portrays women as abhorrent, it implies that transgender people are abhorrent, and it kind of, it, uh, it plays on this old trope in sci-fi of women's bodies being some kind of horror, like having, having horror inflicted upon them because of their female bodies, mm. like people getting impregnated, and then it's a demon alien baby, and then they die or are infertile, and that kind of, stuff comes up quite a lot in male oriented sci-fi um and i i felt definitely that the rc story kind of hearkened to that a bit mm. um and it, it plays into a stereotype as well isn't it because yeah. she's basically she's the crazy psycho ex <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, that, that's just it you know <laughs> to um, i'm gonna hunt down my ex-boyfriend gonna kill him you know <laughs> yeah when i read it the only thing I really felt was that it it um went so far into the this has pushed things too far that it was a little bit ridiculous. I mean, it it was an interesting concept just if you analyze it just objectively and without any emotional baggage. 
But I was like, why does she have to be this crazy anomaly? But at the same time, I still found her more interesting than I'm the pink one, R.C., from from yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I felt like in a so, way it was just kind of taking that, and he was almost trying to subvert it, but then went like way too yeah, far in the other direction. Exactly, way too yeah. Yeah. Top, like on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, and it just yeah, I can completely understand why at the time people hated it. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. It's, well, yeah, like I've said, I didn't hate it, but I also didn't love it. Like, be, yeah. be, back to back to the whole liking Transformers Prime RC better because she's just a person and and she doesn't have any big flag waving. I am the fill in label here one, and so to to take RC and and make her instead of just hi, I'm the new character, to make her one with just um massive sign over her head yeah um, and that was the whole problem really like that was that has been the problem in idw up until a couple years ago when windblade and the other ladies were first introduced was that as much as i wanted to like rc because i felt that she was better written in rid than in the spotlight she was literally always painted with the spotlight over her head saying i am the girl i am the girl and it made it really difficult to like her mm. because i felt like do you guys really think i'm just going to be satisfied with this like she's cool and she beats people up but she always goes hey boys how are you and stuff like that and it just Re- so really it, in rid you think that because because oh, i would disagree yeah. with you i felt like in Definitely. recently in rid that she was not so much the girl as the crazy loose cannon one well that's the thing, it's like, she was very much that, but there were moments where you became, it became really clear to me that like, oh, okay, we get it, she's a girl, okay, we get it, she's a girl, and it was, I found it really interesting how, and that doesn't mean I didn't like her, it was, it was kind of like a different thing, like, I liked her, but I was also really aware that she was the girl, and that that trope is really harmful, um, yeah. and it, I found it really interesting that the the moment Windblade, RC, uh, sorry, Windblade, Nautica, and Chromia were introduced, suddenly RC was much more likable for me because suddenly there were other women around her, and this was in Dark Cybertron, obviously, where they were all together. Yeah. Um. Suddenly there were other women around her. Suddenly there was a girl who was kind of nerdy and a bit quirky, and then there was Windblade who was very tied to like her duty and her honor and all this stuff. And so there were women with different personalities, and it wasn't just her being sort of um, you know, she was burdened with being the only female character. So whatever she did and however she was written, that would inevitably become a part of it because there was nothing else for her to relate to, which is what, you know, which is why I do think that it's, it's very difficult when there's only one female cast member for her to be particularly well written, which is why I think Nautica in More Than Meets the Eye is a very interesting case and Prime and RC, although there are female humans, um, because it does, it, is maybe it's more obvious to me than other people because I kind of think about it a lot when I watch stuff and read stuff, but it, this whole Smurfette trope is sort of, it's really limiting for female characters because it means that they're always burdened with being the woman, basically. Mm. And I felt like well, RC always carried that burden up until the moment that the other female characters were introduced. See, I think she still characters. carries it. Do you remember that scene? I actually really, really liked it where the other girls show up and I think it's Prime. He goes up to RC and he's like, I'm sure you'll have a lot to, you guys, I'm sure you want to get together and talk. And she's like, everyone assumes that I, I want to go talk to them because they're girls, but I don't have anything in common with them. And I, I really feel like RC is much less about whatever strange gender she has now and more about just being very, very isolated from everyone yeah. to an extremely painful degree. And I feel like that is the specific character she has been given is that she mm. is the misfit and will always be the misfit. And I, I really actually hope that at some point she can form some sort of attachment. In fact, I'm actually really, really looking forward to when Merigrid writes that one shot about all the girls, like, uh, what is it, um, Combiner Hunters or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to that because I really want to see how RC would fit in with the other girls from Kaminus. Yeah. I'm hoping that she is allowed to grow past being 
the outcast weirdo that no one yeah, really knows what to do with. It's- like you, yeah, you, you rightly point out that it's kind of her personality to be a bit of a loner and to feel like she's the outsider. Um, yeah. The problem with that before was that she was the outsider because she was a woman and she was also literally the only woman. Whereas when there were other female characters around, she was allowed to be an outsider because she was an outsider. And obviously yeah. she'll always carry the weight of the spotlight uh, storyline. Mm-hmm. But um, I do think that it, definitely sort of help to ease the, the the pain of there only being like <laughs> one fucking woman. <laughs> she she does read to me, you know, all all apologies to people who care about vocabulary because I don't have the backup, but she does read to me more as a an uncomfortable transgender person than as a just a straight up well, I, I, th- I think I think I think that, that well, it, it is problematic. I think to come up with that interpretation because she's uh, her her gender was forced upon her. Yeah, which yeah. is yeah. not the case and, with transgender yeah. people. Transgender yeah. people are born in their gender, yeah. and, and then they they transition. Yeah, yeah, and and that see to me, I honestly I find that fascinating as a sci-fi concept. The whole guess what we are going to force you to be something now. It's a horrible idea, and so I, I actually, whenever that is shown to have been horrible to her, that's good. That's good writing, as opposed to just meh. That happened. Moving on. Um, you know, we're we're living in a time when comic books are willing to go to really, really horrible places, and I'm talking about Getaway right now. But, um, no one's going to let that go anytime soon, are they? <sighs> I've been mad about Getaway since blinking last year's BotCon when he first did his little hitting on tailgate thing. <laughs> well, just let it play out. It might, not be, <laughs> yeah. it might not be what we think it is. It could be worse. Like, James always calls me, remember the title. It's going to be worse. <laughs> There's going to be like a tailgate shrine and getaway room, like bits of... Bits of energy on that he didn't finish that was all like stacked up on oh, the wall. Oh, that's messed up. Pictures where he's cut out Cyclonus and glued himself in. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to be so much worse. Oh dear. So, oh, God. Well, yeah. it, it it might actually be interesting to to talk about Getaway a bit in 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 context of this conversation mm-hmm. because there's a lot of well outside baggage that that readers bring in. To interpret that scene, mm. like it, it's it, it's um, it's called it's been called rapey uh, and creepy, and it's it's been framed as this this creepy dude hitting on on uh, a girl in in the club and trying to get her drunk and uh, manipulate her. And it's interesting that people uh, because this this is of course outside uh, interpretation. Uh, what happens inside the comic is is something completely different. Probably will turn out to be completely different, but. You know, this, uh, this is probably also because of, of the context of, of the current social discussions that we have a lot, uh, in and outside the geek, uh, community about issues that women face. Mm. And I think that, that readers bring that with them in their interpretation in the scene, yeah. whereas they might not have done so ten years ago. Mm. Yeah. And it was uh, definitely interesting to see that that particular moment was what struck a chord as being, like, the most horrific thing people saw in that comic when an issue ago was focused on the DJD and the DJD are like fucking Uh (laughs) but obviously that kind of evil if you want to put it that way is more readily it's it's not personal because we don't experience it that way yeah exactly Uh, that's the thing that a lot of women have experienced uh, and and men too maybe so it's more relatable as something that would make you feel upset or uncomfortable so it was really interesting to see that with all the things, the horrible yeah. things that happened in More Than Meets the Eye, that that was the thing where people were going, I hate that character. He's a horrible person. And it's yeah, like, and, and it's also, what? it's also a face, that, uh, a fear that we're raised into, uh, women in particular. Like, mm-hmm. we're, we're always being told, you know, be, be wary, pay attention to your drink, you know, don't trust guys who act a certain way. Yeah, I remember when I was reading it, I was like, tailgate, don't let him buy you any more drinks. Just walk away. <laughs> just seriously, <laughs> kick him in the nuts and walk away. Just go. <laughs> I just hear this ma- massive clanging sound. Also, I'd like to thank you all for reminding me of something horrible that happened to me in a club once. 
<laughs> where uh, a very large woman grabbed me by my face and literally lifted me off the ground. Wow. And yelled, you're fit, and tried to walk off with me. Holy shit. I am not even remotely <laughs> kidding. She That's was horrible. about six and a half feet tall and built like a wall. Said, you're fit, wow. grabbed me by my face, and lifted me off the ground and tried to walk off me. My friend, my roommate at the time, grabbed me, screamed, he's mine, and attempted to literally weigh me down so I could get my feet back on the ground. So, that, thank you for reminding is, me of that. That is freaky. That is a, you weren't there. <laughs> she was really big. Wow. Yeah. So, Getaway. Getaway is a good example of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... Moving on from Getaway, we we move on from Spotlight RC, and we are in the modern era where, perhaps independent of, um, I know James and John are both, I, I would have described them as fairly progressive writers. Uh, you know, they've done stuff with Transformers that no one else has ever done. You you got you got to give credit to to basically the, the entire team. Uh... Yeah. The entire IDW. Oh team God! Though. Like IDW, Hasbro, everyone involved. Like the guys at Hasbro, yeah. who heard half these ideas, and like the, who that one guy. Usually, I make fun of that guy at Hasbro for ruining everything. That the new, the other that guy at Hasbro so, turned around and said, "We can make Megatron good. That'd be cool. We could change size." And they were just like, "Oh my God!" But <laughs> I would have thought that that would be so interesting. Oh, he's Britain. so much like... more interesting nowadays. I need, I need a. Ch- an accurate version of that figure on my desk. But we find out that Windblade is going to be a female, and due to the announcement prior to the vote that whatever character is voted in will be in the comics, we now have our female character brought in. She's introduced a little differently than she became. She was a bit more standoffish and kind of the big one in the background. Uh, but she brought... <laughs> You're totally right. Well, she was she, feel, Also, wonder, she, she was, was huge. Totally the she, big one. She yeah. was the one. Yeah. She was huge. She was too big. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna, like, Windblade's gonna reach out of the comic and grab you by the face. My face is off limits. Oh. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, we ha- also brought along two very unexpected characters that I don't think any of us actually thought were gonna be there. Because I, I think when I, when I heard Windblade was coming, gonna be in the comics, I assumed it was gonna be like a one-shot issue. I didn't, I certainly didn't expect her to be introduced alongside two other mm. female characters. And we got one who is previously established, Chromia, and another new character, Nautica. Uh, both of which have in their own ways become little bits of darlings. I have seen the phrase, Chromia has done nothing wrong, band- bandied about the internet. It's hilarious. She has. What? I'm just saying, she <laughs> yeah, has. So is everyone in Transformers. I know, I know. Yes, <laughs> yes. Before. Everyone's wrong. That's the best thing about Transformers. <laughs> no one's right. My favorite character, biggest murderer in the thing. Which one is that? I'm trying to think, and there's like ten characters that could be. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> the entire DJD and bro. <laughs> and um, yeah, we get our three characters who reinvent the landscape of IDW in many ways. We are introduced to a planet where we have both genders existing um, simultaneously. Recent issues have laid the groundwork for the idea that the current state on, on Cybertron is an anomaly thing. An abnormally anomaly. Jesus Christ, oh my God. I'm doing well today. That that in Cybertron yeah, naturally had females and something happened. I have my own pet theory involving Nova Prime, Vector Prime, and Functionism. Ve- Vector Sigma, rather, uh, and Functionism. They had a ripple effect that I honestly didn't see coming. And now we have Victorion announced, who will be in... I'm not sure if the story's going to be in continuity, given it seems to be promoting both Victorion and an SDCC set. So, yeah, to be honest, I'm a little bit confused about the whole Combiner Wars thing as it is. Oh my god, it's it's I, <laughs> it's not just me. Right? <laughs> will 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 she be introduced hmm? during Combiner Wars, or will she be introduced in Combiner Hunters? That's a very good question. I mean, they're making it sound like Combiner Hunters because I think Combiner Wars yeah. is focused on Devastator Defense or Superior on Minosaur. I think I think Combiner well Combiner Wars will be over pretty soon. Yeah, and I think that might be too early. I would have been I would have been interested to see it as like a side series rather than a two main series, but um, of course, Windblade is now getting her second series, which will be an ongoing at least for Yay! the for the moment. We're introduced to loads of new female characters like Mistress of Flame. Nickel Nickel is introduced as a female character independent of Caminus. Well, they found her in a colony, didn't they? Yeah, just um, yeah. Prion. Prion and Prion's dead. Yeah, there are colonies with females. Prion is super dead. We have the idea that Solus Prime is. Solus Prime and the Thirteen are deified, but not necessarily deities. 
which I personally adore. The the playing fields changed a lot. How do you going from like their, the announcement to current state of affairs? I mean, how how have you reacted to it? I mean, have have you seen any negatives pop up in the whole thing, or has it been a mostly positive experience? Oh, I've definitely seen negative <laughs> comments, but but you know, genuinely though, I am surprised in that the negative comments they seem to be isolated in a particular location. <laughs> there are sort of, there are Hi, Chris. <laughs> there are dissenters who will come in and argue the case opposite to them, and it generally, I would like to think that I'm pretty sort of aware of the Transformers fandom, probably, and it seems to me that generally this is something that people are really excited about, something that people want, whether they're male or female or any other particular gender. People are really interested in this and excited about it. Um, and I know that, you know, for me, I remember when when we got not just Windblade but Nautica and Chromia as well. I was completely like, "Holy shit! What the fuck? This blows my mind! Three whole female characters! <laughs> now there's four of them! What the fuck?" Hey, hey, I have done the math. Three is actually quite a significant number. <laughs> Compared to the hundreds and hundreds of male Transformers, obviously. Six out of um, 6,274 female characters make up females make 11 percent of the character roster and 1.2 percent of the toys. So it's around 6,000-ish male characters. How many in, in numbers, not percentages, is that female? 60. <laughs> 60. Really? Is it that many? 60 or 600. I, I, yeah, 600 female and- characters, about 60 toys. There, I, brought, I added up there are a total of 80 female toys there or thereabouts. I actually thought it was less than that, you know? Yeah. How many of those have had significant story narratives? Uh, yeah. let's see. Three of those were just like... 37 repaints. repaints, 25 original molds, 17 gender swap toys were originally males, one half male, half female, a couple of examples of female toys made into males. Strong Arms are a reason one of that. 31% of toys were made to be a female character. Victorian will represent 7% of all female toys in the last three decades. That was the figure that stuck out to me when you sent me all those. It was like, that is both really funny and really depressing. <laughs> um, and of those who have major character roles, you are looking at between 10 and 15%. I have too much time in my hands. No, um, no, no, this is important. Yeah. <laughs> I was bored one day. I didn't want to do pterosaurs. I did maths. Um, yeah. I, I do... I do find it an interesting time, though, especially yeah. with, with um, regards to the IDW fi- fiction, mm. because people were like, well, Windblade, you know, what what's the big deal about Windblade? Because we've had female characters before. But it's, I think, the first time that we've got a female-centric story Yeah. that's with, with a female title character who has, well, we, we've got three new characters introduced at the same time. And, and usually, uh, female characters in Transformers are very isolated. We've got the first female creative team on Transformers. I think the first female writer on Transformers comics, uh, first female artist on comics, uh, Transformers comics. Uh, and those are all pretty big deals. That's, yeah, that's, definitely. that, those are all firsts. And the fact that it's leading to more female artists, uh, and creators yeah, be, being introduced because we, as well. We now, we I now mean, have two female creative teams. On yeah. the comics, because we have uh, Margaret Scott and uh, Sarah Stone on on Windblade, and we have Georgia Ball and Priscilla on R.I.D. And and you know Joanna's been coloring more than me see for ages, so oh yeah, yeah of course yeah, but, but yeah, people, yeah. People, well. we've had uh, female colorists for ages because we yeah. have Joanna oh, and we've true. had Priscilla, and they've been around yeah. since. Yeah. Very early. The thing that has affected me even more than having female characters introduced is having the stories themselves move away from who would win in a fight toward who gets along with whom and how do they get along and who cares about whom and how. Oh, yes. I think it's really interesting that the female, like the, the introduction of female characters is happening now at a time when Transformers comics, like you say, are more than just this big robot punched this big robot, and then the other big robot punched the other big robot. And no insult to a previous Transformers comic. But I think it is really interesting that, you know, particularly something like More Than Meets the Eye, James is not only very good at writing female characters, but, and he's also introduced a gay couple, but also he does inject a certain amount of sort of 
social commentary and references to things that happened in real human history with Megatron and stuff like that. Um, he draws his influences from a lot of different interesting places. And I don't know if I've really seen that done in Transformers a lot before. Maybe in little pockets, but certainly not as broadly as in More Than Meets the Eye. You can really kind of go, well, this Megatron uh, storyline is really linked to this and blah, 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 blah. So I think it's really interesting that that's happening now when the Transformers comics are becoming sort of really good sci-fi as opposed to a silly comic about Transformers. Yeah. Mm. Well, and the thing that's been, that's been, you know, back to my whole self-loathing thing, it's been a really uh, a hard transition for me because I've been, you know, self-indoctrinated with this idea that if it's about feelings, it's less, uh, good or worthy or whatever than if it's about something that, okay Punching. facing facing up to the fact that i personally would much rather read a story about who cares about whom and why than i would about reading punching and yet at the same time telling myself but no you're not supposed to like that that's girly and surprise misogyny <laughs> and and it's i know and i'm like gosh dang it and you know the, this whole like back and forth that I've had with Alex Milne recently where he's like, because I said some comment about how I have a hard time taking quote-unquote girly art as seriously as quote-unquote boy art where like um, Sarah Stone's style was a big, massive thing for me to take in because A, it is beautiful and good and B, you know, we, we talk about in comic books the sexualization of characters and, and people are like, well, the dudes are sexualized. Look how muscle they are. And, and the gar- girls are like, the girls reading it are like, no, they don't do anything for us. And yet here's Sarah drawing Starscream as like, total smacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and back to Overlord, like blinking Overlord, man. I was just rereading records, records, and I'm like, this blinking robot is just walking around being like, I will kill you, but you'll like it because I'm so handsome. You're part of the problem. And, and, you know, and, but see, this whole time I've been telling myself, this is not a valid feeling. You cannot care about this sort of stuff. That is beneath you. You must care about world building, which I do care about. And, but, but you know what I mean? And, and I'm like, this is cool because these, these writers and creators that we have now are saying, you know what? We're going to acknowledge that there's a huge segment of the population that whether secretly or not, really enjoys reading these kind of stories <laughs> and looking at this kind of art. And so I, while I appreciate it, it's taken me a long time to make peace with it and be like, you know what? I am allowed to like it. That's good. I'm glad that's happened to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are standing over there on your enlightened pedestal being like, we, 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 we came to that realization years ago when we were five. <laughs> I'm like... So, I mean, I think that's a big part of it as well, the whole kind of characters having emotional connections, having genuine friendships and rivals and very different relationships and types of friendships and relationships. It's fascinating! It's part of the world building. It's part of Cybertronian culture and thinking about, well, how do these alien robots that can turn into cars and planes, how do they have friends? How do they have lovers? How do they have different political groups and social... It's basically like, how can you have... Four million years of war if you don't care about anyone or anything. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, the whole, it's all based on, on classism. The, 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 the reason the war began is all based on classism and a type of racism, if you think about it that way. And it's really interesting for me personally to think about that kind of thing. Like, well, function, the functionists are basically, you know, they're classifying people the way the Nazis did in a way. Like, it's all, it's all very relatable to human experiences, I think, and that's what makes it so interesting, and that's why the emotional aspect of it is so important and makes it even better. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I love especially about Modern Meets is that we get a lot of things in it. I mean, there, there is plot, and there, sure, there are robots punching each other occasionally, uh, but, but there's, <laughs> there's just so many aspects of it, like you have the emotional aspect, and you have the historical aspect, and the social commentary on it, and it is very dense, and it's if you're interested in one thing, you can read it for that, if you're yeah. re- interested in something else, you can read it for that. 
We're so yeah, lucky to live right now. So lucky. Oh yeah. Is that more to me? Yeah, especially I, I. I always say it's like the the Transformers comic that I always wanted. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It, 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 it's been really cool and terrifying to have James Roberts be like, you know that secret fan fiction that you've been writing for years and years and years? Look, I made a comic book of it for you. <laughs> and I'm like, but it was secret. I was ashamed of it. And he's like, here you go. I'm like, but, but it's written by a man, so I have to take it seriously. And, <laughs> oh, gosh, you guys. It's like, yeah. I was scared to get on this podcast because I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be really honest with these people. Well, you'll <laughs> do that. <laughs> the whole sort of fanfic thing, I think I actually find really interesting because even though it's not personally what I go for, I'm more of a sort of visual person. Like I really like fan art, but even fan art ties into this as well, actually, is this whole concept of like when when men write comics with previously established characters, you know, that's that's comics. And when women do it, it's fanfic and that's shit. <laughs> And yeah. it's like, you know, do you really think that the people who write Spider-Man now, do you really think they never wrote a Spider-Man fanfic before they wrote a Spider-Man comic? Like, really? Yeah. So, and basically, Marvel, DC, and even the IDW Transformers comics, essentially they are glorified fanfic because they're taking previously established characters and they're putting them into a new setting and doing a different thing with them, which is basically what fanfic is. And it's really interesting that there is a kind of divide because I do think it is maybe a fact that the female side of a fandom generally tends to be the side that is more centered around fanfic and fan art and cosplay and things that are kind of transformative, forgive the pun. <laughs> and actually, I think me and Sprite were talking about this recently. There was a really interesting Reddit post that I shared uh, where this guy was talking. He was talking, I think, specifically about the Doctor Who fandom. But basically, mm-hmm. he was talking about how there are sort of two types of fandom and one type is curative and one type is transformative. And the curative fandom, generally speaking, but not always, tends to be the more male side of the fandom. And that tends to be about kind of fact finding and preserving things and finding, you know, the ultimate version of the thing and and cataloging. And the transformative side of the fandom tends to often be more female oriented or and people of color and LGBT people as well, or any kind of people who are sort of you know, they're not considered the the norm or they're like the outsider and they create transformative works because they don't tend to see themselves represented in fiction as much. So like, you know, women tend to not have as many characters that are like them in, in fiction. They're, they're so basically... they create characters or they create fan art or they cosplay and they change things so that they can see themselves represented in it. So that's that's fascinating because you're totally right. That's totally why. Like I was like, I must write this or I will explode because it does not exist. And then John goes, here, I've ended the war for you. And then James goes, here, look, Megatron is like getting along with people. I'm like, oh, I love you people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so when men do it, people go, oh, my God. And then they turn around and they laugh at female fans who write fanfic or do fan art or cosplay. And it's like, yeah, but they're basically doing what the guys are doing. Maybe they're not being paid for it, but it's essentially the same creative thing isn't it mm. um, so it's really interesting to see that women tend to maybe get ridiculed for it while men tend to get praised for it um and it is you know the, this whole i find it really interesting and it's something i kind of want to look into more just for myself maybe this whole idea of transformative fandom being a place for people who aren't represented in media and that being the reason why there's it's led to this sort of community on places like tumblr where there's a very welcoming attitude to sort of uh, head cannons that change a character into a person of color or people cosplaying characters that aren't the same race as them because it allows them to feel represented in some way. I still feel yeah. like the fandom is stratified though. Like I remember I came across a chart on the internet once. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's so true. Where they're like, here's like the, and I forget how it was subdivided out, but I know that personally I go, okay, yeah, I write fan fiction. But I don't write porn fiction, so I'm better than the porn fiction people. <laughs> and, like, or like, I, I draw fan art, but I don't draw porn fan art. I've had really interesting conversation and interactions with people who do that sort of thing for very personal, very non-flippant reasons. Yeah. And, I, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because like, obviously we joke about it because it can be quite funny, but like, <laughs> The idea that women women create porn through fan fiction or through fan art is I find it interesting because I've seen a lot of sort of stuff uh, in defense of it 
basically saying that mainstream porn is not for women, it's for men, uh, yeah. straight men. And straight women, uh, and lesbians actually don't really get serviced by porn, so they go and create their own. And it tends to be very, very different from the porn you would see on like porn websites because they're writing for themselves and what they actually yeah. want. And it's really interesting, I think, that that has become a phenomenon. Mm. Uh, cause it ties into that whole transformative versus curative thing, actually, I think, where women see, well, there's nothing for me here in this particular well, some- thing. Yeah. So I'll go and make the thing that I want and, you yeah. know, fair play to them, really. <laughs> I mean, and every so often, like, there was, there was somebody, oh, like a few months before it, the whole bit came out where, where Tailgate had actually made a new horn for Cyclonus. Someone had done this really adorable little fan art of Tailgate making a horn for Cyclonus. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you were so happy that day when you got that comic book, weren't you? <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it's just an interesting community to be part of. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of fun and yet, you know, uh, one day I'll get over all of my weird internal conflict. Come there, <laughs> come to whatever there. replaces AA. We'll bring you cake. Dude, guys, 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 <laughs> for the record, I am coming to AA this year. Woo! You have made a horrible so... mistake. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, you and Nicole. Oh, good, good god. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, um, cool. I think we've covered most of the bases now. Um, is there, a, before we wind up, is there anything anyone would like to add that they feel we could have gone into more detail or that we didn't cover that you just, you've been wanting to mention the whole time? Um, I, I was going to talk a bit more about Victorian at one point and then kind of got sidetracked because that's what I do. You, no, um, no, but, you, <laughs> no, focus no. like a laser <laughs> that's been bounced off mirrors. Uh, the thing that really excites me about Victorion and the idea of a combiner team of female Transformers, um, and I know I, I saw a lot of people saying, oh, well, why couldn't it be a mixed gender team and stuff like that? But I think what's, and, and you know, is separate but equal, really equal, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, no, it won't be equal because there's still like 6,000 male Transformers. I did. But the thing that's really in- going to be interesting about it is to see a team of women who they work together and presumably will some of them will be friends and some of them might be rivals and that's the thing you normally get for the male characters mm. but you normally you know you get the one female character like RC in prime and so it's going to be really interesting i think to see a team of transformers who are all female working together and who are also a combiner because that's just going to be really really cool mm. but yeah it, it will mean that we'll have a team of characters who just cannot be the isolated smurfette like they just they have to be a team together and it's gonna it's gonna be really cool. Hmm. I still need there to be a reason for there to be only women in that, that combiner. Otherwise it, it's oh, the Smurfette like, combiner I've, I've and it's a continuation of the RC isolation. My current one is that they are an ancient combiner team from before women disappeared from Cybertron. And oh, that'd be fun. something happened that caused them to be limit like a, a relic population of females escaped and it included these individuals who the who use the enigma to turn themselves into combiners in order to protect the others hmm. that's my current that's cool. current one but it's basically my idea for why females aren't on cybertron functionists didn't see a point so they fiddled with vector sigma and the pulses stopped fending out whatever it was that made women. It's, it's kind of a trap in a way with transformers and i know that it's it's kind of unavoidable because of the history of the franchise hmm. but it kind of it kind of gets a bit weird that there always <laughs> needs to be a reason for women to be it there. Does. I completely it understand does. why people try to rationalise it as well. Yep. Like I understand both sides, but at the same time, it's like, well, there's no reason why the rest of them are male. Um, but that's what I see on on a certain place. <laughs> that's why I got the functionist well, idea because they're yeah. Well, I got I got to point out that. The functionist universe, where the functionist took over, has female transformers. Ah, I have okay, an that's nice. and Oh yeah. The one, I have and an the one where that. they didn't take over, where they basically disappeared, that's where the ah, female but the transformers functionists would are in branch their out into the into the established Cybertronian colonies, even if they're not making an empire. And as we see, they're in the process of expanding their influence considerably. So my theory there is that they haven't gotten to the females from the other colonies yet. They're getting there. They're dealing with sort of internal Cybertron issues and then will expand outwards because they're assholes. <laughs> I, again, too much time on my hands. 
part just being deemed unnecessary. <laughs> well, to be fair, I feel sorry for Jetfire. Energy on Jetfire. He was already unnecessary, and then they blew his head off. He already sucked. At least, at least, like, the wrong impersonator was cool. Yeah, she was really cool. But, uh, you know, and like, I, you know, I, I don't think there was many people who read that and didn't notice that Rewind didn't go like they or anything. Just like, she was just this casual thing thrown out. Yeah, I mean, I guess, to oh, be honest, oh, I feel like oh. the best thing that could happen mm -hmm. is for it, and I know this probably would be difficult, but in a way, for it to just be normal now and, and for people to just accept that these are the faults of the past creative teams mm. and we can't change that really, but we can change what we have now and for it to pretty much be seen as normal, I think would be the best mm. thing. But then you could also argue that maybe people would say, well, why weren't they there before story wise? And, yeah. and that's a curse of, of the franchise really that we can't get away from because it's 30 years old. <laughs> Yeah, uh, also, Victorian should have been Decepticon, just saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, Sprite, Hahi, anything you'd like to add? I've spewed my guts out, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to the future. Yeah, yeah same. It's, it's just gonna get better from here on. Alright, well just, last thing, last thing, we can get one more thing out of this before we get the two hour mark. One, currently established female character you want to see in one of the series and how she's going to be awesome. So, hi. Wait, currently established? Currently, like, not in IDW, but, it, like, I get, it's like the first question, someone from outside of IDW oh. you'd like to be brought in. And you can't say Elite Flame Wars Thunder Blast because... Alita one. Alita one. Not even a contest. I've been agitating for her for years. I, I need her to... I want her to be a leader of one of the other colonies, and I want her to be awesome. Yeah. Is it? Uh, I already said mine earlier, and it was again Alita one. <laughs> like I said, she has to be buff and she has to be tough as hell. I would be. Re it would be really cool. I agree for her to be a leader of another colony. Mm. Um, yeah, I just think it would be really cool if she was brought back and she was allowed to be given the the full glory that she deserves. Yeah, Sprite, Cliff, Cliff, Cliff. I just want Cliff. Cliff. <laughs> Why Cliff? Like Cliff, because she's kind of an anthropologist, and that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm an anthropologist. Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> Your contrib you can hang out with Tailgate and Nickel in the short corner. You may not... Well, th 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 there's also that, because she's uh, she's kind of like a, a bumblebee redo, mm. so she's not a stereotypical way he female character. Mm. And, and we need more shorties. <laughs> we, ladies and gentlemen, we need more shorties. Yep. Ori will be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've already mentioned her as well. I would love to see Stryker. I would absolutely mm -hmm. love to I'd actually like to see Arachnid. I, I, think, I think most of the fandom would love to see Stryker. I would like to see yeah. Stryker yeah, ride in on a dino. Especially because we do need more female Decepticons, actually. We absolutely do. Yeah, we do. And she needs to ride in on a dinosaur if she shows up. <laughs> kind of she needs to just, I brought them back. And no, she, she could ride in on Grimlock. No, they could no, no. find her. No, 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 no. It has to be a real dinosaur. We got, and and like, she's riding on a dino when she comes. Yeah, yeah. And everybody, <laughs> and she looked her, Where did that come from? I made it. I am Striker. <laughs> I have arrived. Either that or Arachnid, because uh, Arachnid, I think, was a character who had a lot of potential that never really went anywhere because she got her ass kicked by Soundwave, who was amazing. But it would be nice to see her in a in an extra character and. Like, if we get Arachnid, we get Knockout, and I'm happy, because everything leads to Knockout. <laughs> yeah, if we could pick a male character, I would definitely go for Knockout. That's amazing. <laughs> Best, please introduce him to our uh, Knockout needs more. Just more. Didn't Knockout make an appearance in Moonblade? Mm. Or, uh, kind of, sort of, but it's one of those things that it has to be picked up by a writer before I'll... Like, Margaret has to write him as Knockout before someone else comes in and either makes him someone else or throws Knockout in somewhere else. Because I don't know if anyone's like officially like said knockout will be in issue X. I know a lot of people want to do him, but hmm. um, I know she intended the character to be him, but it's never been officially like here is here is the word on page that it will be knockout. You know. Yeah, I seem to remember Andrew saying something about it, but actually it was probably a while ago now, and maybe he was just kind of saying I hope mm -hmm. it happens because I want to draw him or something. As far as I know, all three. Artists would like to knock out. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I would actually like to see him show up in every book independently with no explanation. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just completely different vibes. And it just becomes this like time hopping <laughs> character who shows up everywhere. Yeah, and everyone just it's Deadpool. Yeah, and Deadpool. <laughs> right. So I think that will wrap up on that. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah, this was an uh, enjoyable couple of hours. I heard many things and. Yeah, lots to think about. I enjoy thinking. It is uh, a vice and a hobby. Thank, really, genuine, really, really enjoyed this one. So, as always, we like to have people shill themselves out a bit because that is how we get people to come back. So, Hahi, where can the folks find you if they want to? Well, the the upside of choosing such a random name as Hahi Prime, which is a, a combination of my littlest brother's nickname for me and, you know, obviously Prime, is that no one else chose it. So, <laughs> I get to be Hahi Prime, like, everywhere. So I'm on DeviantArt, I'm on fanfiction.net, I'm on Twitter, you can find me there, I'm really bad at using it. I'm on Facebook, um, and that's about it. And occasionally I get to talk to you guys! Uh, is that? Uh, I am on Tumblr and Twitter, and I am Evil Clever Dog on both those, and you can see cosplay photos and me getting very angry at video games on both of them. Yes, yes, you can. Uh, to be fair, if anyone hasn't seen this, it's called, I really do check it out. There's some incredible work out there. Like, Thanks, bud. <laughs> I, I speak the truth. I want to slap you, and you make good cosplay. Uh, Sprite? Um, I'm Fizzy Thrones Flame on Tumblr. Uh, I think I'm Spriteling113 on Twitter. And you can find me there for art and feminism. <laughs> <laughs> you should re- have you named your like Twitter page that yet? Because you really should. Yeah, I, I I used to I used to call it uh um what was it again uh feminist rants and more meets the eye gushing. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, there and of course you can find this podcast over on the com. You can find me over on the moonbase two. Uh, dot libsyn dot com uh, moonbase two forum yeah, we're also on iTunes both underbase and moonbase um, you can find me also on the old owl house doing occasional articles I'm currently in the middle of a big series that is taking me forever to write which is basically franchise comics and why they kind of sometimes suck and should be given more chances where I did an entire article about how the Thundercats comic in the early two thousands was terrible because of what it did to Chitara a lot read that. I got sad looking for pictures for references. You can also find various other podcasts on the other base. They do the moon, uh, the moon, <laughs> but they don't do the moon base. Do the moon meets the eye reviews. We've got Wimblade with, and we have RID. So check those out if you got time. There's some really good shows. Thank you all again for coming. Again, as always, we don't know when the next comic basement, uh, Mikey's comic basement, uh, I got yelled at for not saying the full name. Uh, Mikey's comic basement is coming out. Uh, if you would like to participate in any way, let me know. Um, you can have an idea yourself. I can come up with one for you if you've got an interest you'd like to see us uh, go on, but you're not really sure how to approach it, uh, be aware that this isn't a regular show. It's based on my own free time and everything else, and there is a small queue forming. Uh, it is an orderly queue, uh, but the eyes are mad. So, you know, if you don't hear back from me straight away, don't get discouraged. I'll get to you eventually. So, thank you all for listening. Thank you three for being here. I really, really enjoyed this one. And, yeah, we will talk to you all later. Bye! Bye! Transmission.